Well, I'm a, I, I am a storyteller. I like to tell stories and so forth and so on. My grandfather was George Lovick Pierce Wren. He was born in 1836, and his father moved here in 1845 and covered in about three covered wagons and a bunch of slaves. And about 1855, he sent my grandfather and a brother back to Georgia to Emory University to get a college education. The Civil War came along and he was living uh, down at Sibley, so he joined the Civil War with the Memnon Blues. And when he was fighting in the Civil War, well, he was captured twice and wounded twice. 19 battles in the Civil War, including uh, Battle of Bull Run, Manassas, Gettysburg, Sharpsburg. Sharpsburg was the most lives ever lost in a one day in the history of the United States. The Battle of Antietam, and he got wounded, and he got into prison, and he was in the prison when the war was over and on Mosquito Island in the state of Delaware. And when the war was over, they opened the gate and said, y'all go home, and according to my grandmother, he walked home. I'm guessing he caught a ride somewhere on a boat on the Mississippi River. But anyway, he came home and then went to farming and, and they hired him to teach school at this new school up here. And he taught for over 20 years in that school up there and made an outstanding name for himself. And they wanted him because they, back then, then too, pe too many people have a college education. And then after about 20 years, he ran for state representative in Louisiana eight years and then after that he ran for state senator. He didn't run anymore and I checked on that and found out he didn't run because he got disgusted with politics. Built a house right here. At first it had a log cabin right here, but he died in 1901. Of course, that was way before I was born. I was born in, in uh, 1924. I was born January of 24, which makes me 93 today. My parents were in the milk business, milking cows and bottling milk and delivering milk seven days a week, 365 days a year, twice a day. But that's why we did then because we didn't have electricity. We milked cows by hand. We got up in the morning, a little after four o'clock, milk cows, bottled milk, and ran to town and delivered it morning and night, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And then the war came along, and they were doing that during the war. And it got, I got deferment because it was a vital industry. It was three, six months deferment. So I didn't go into World War II until kind of late after. But anyway, I went in it in 1944 and went to Camp Robinson up at Little Rock, Arkansas and was trained up there in the infantry. We loaded on the train in Shreveport and went to San Francisco and then stayed there for a little bit. And then they loaded us on a troop ship and put 5,000 GIs on that troop ship. And then we went to the Pacific and we were over 30 days on that boat and, and they were just packed on like sardines on that boat. They had uh, bunks, five, uh, five high, like five laying on it. And I started out on the bottom and, and the fellow swapped with me for the top bunk. I got the top bunk, which was a big, big help because we were falling equally, and what we had was a fan on that ship was blowing, and but it was hot, hot, and you'd wake up in the morning, you'd be sweating so you'd, and your canvas on your cot would be just standing in water you'd, from sweat. Elements of the 37th Division advancing along Highway 9 northwest of Baguio, former summer capital of the Philippines. Japs atop Mount Mirador hold up the advance from a monastery overlooking the city. And I remember the very first night we got Philippines and they, and they unloaded us on Lungay and Gulf and we slept out in the field out in there and they told us to be careful. The Japs, they'd push the Japs back out of that, back up in the mountains. But anyway, that night we laid out there and I know it was caribou, you know, big old cows out there and a few of them roaming around there and they got shot that night because everybody got pretty nervous about the Japanese coming and getting us. But anyway, the next day, they loaded us up on trucks and carried us up into the mountains. The truck just couldn't get on the road up in those mountains in there, and you'd look out the side way, way down there. But, And I remember walking to the front lines, we came upon some dead Japanese, and they were just 
laying down on the ground, all swollen up and so forth. It was kind of an awful sight. And when we got up there, the, all the trees were shot off. And we went that way, and we had a little shovel. Every one of us had a little shovel on his back to dig us a foxhole. And so at night, <clears throat> we would dig a foxhole about six feet long and about three feet wide and put three GIs in that foxhole. And we got a perimeter, and our, our company commanders and all this, they were in the middle, and we were all the way around it, and we set guard at night. I can remember one night I was up there, and they had their battle cry was, Banza, Banza, Banza! And they'd yell, 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 go down there. And we'd had a real uh, tight day that day, and I almost got killed that day. It was very, very forced. I was the first scout and kind of old trails that these Japs had made up there. And I was kind of going out a little old trail down there and kind of came to an opening out of the little trees and so forth were there. And I stopped and waited. The trail had a split fork in it. And I waited till Sergeant Lesh came up there and asked him which way to go. And he was he was a second scout. He was covering us, whoever was first or second scout. And then he covered us. And so he said, take the right. And I went that sneaking down the right with my hand the rifle, kind of sneaking down through there. And I got down and been, oh, walking for, say, 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, boom, I heard a gun go over a wheel around shot. And there's a Japanese that was standing behind a rice paddy. Paddy's about that high. He was over behind it. He sh rose up to shoot me. And when he did, Sergeant Les shot him. I turned around just time to see him fall. And I remember I prayed, God, if you get me out of here, I'll be a better Christian the rest of my life. You know, that, I remember one night those Japanese were yelling and hollering and going on, and I was nervous about my experience just getting close to getting shot. And uh, I was sitting there and wet and it's kind of raining and sitting on that poncho and sitting on my helmet and sitting there and watching them. Those Japanese got to yelling and the hollering and sound like they wasn't 30 yards from it. I got trembling so bad that I held my mouth open. I remember my, my teeth was just chatting. And uh, so to keep my t Japanese from hearing me, I held my mouth open. And my mouth just going like, like that, you know, floppy. For a rest camp, we were uh, kind of guarding the artillery. And while they were shooting at them, they shoot these big old 105s and 155 cannons. And it took valley out there in a the mountain about two miles on the other side. And, and it, they, they had discovered with binoculars those Japanese on that mountain over there. And they got a shooting at them and they got to hitting in that hole. And those Japs started running out. And boy, we were like a, in a football game. We were yelling, shoot them, shoot them, shoot them. And they were running and going on and coming out of those holes like ants coming out of an anthill. Of course, while we were fighting them, they were... The Japanese really would not surrender. They wouldn't surrender at all. They would do death. We had, uh, in my outfit, we had a little old fella in our outfit from up in northern Arkansas was named Willie Brown, 32nd Division of the 8th Infantry, I believe it was. And while they were down there, they went to uh, Australia, and Willie Brown met a girl in Merida while he was down there. And uh, if you would, anybody would capture and bring a Japanese in while we're fighting them before the war, when the war was going on, it bring and they would give them a a, a fur, pretty good furlough to Australia. And Willie Brown told us one morning he came and said, "Men, y'all don't come after me, but I got to go see my wife. He'd married this girl in in Australia, and he wanted to go back. And he had hand grenades all in his belt around." And he had two pistols on him, and he had a little small a carbine, and not a not a big rifle, but a carbine. And what he would do, he'd sneak around, he'd sneak up and get come to a hole. He knew Japs were in that, and he'd come up, put, take those hand grenades and pull the pin out, and throw them in, and pull the pin out, and throw it in, pull the pin out, and throw it in, throw it in. And then he'd wait a little bit after, and he'd count all of them, be sure they'd gone off. And then he'd jump in that hole with them, and he'd shoot any of them alive except one, and he'd get one and he'd pull him out and drag him. And he came down the mountain. He they were up the mountain from us. And he came down there and he, that Japanese was yelling and screaming and going on. And you know, we couldn't tell what he was saying. We couldn't tell any Japanese, but he was coming down there and he was going and said, I'm, I'm going to see my wife. I'm going, y'all leave, don't bother my prison. 
came down there and big, a big old tree up there and he got a chain in it. And they chained that prisoner to that thing so they got him and carried him out somewhere to interrogate him to find out what was NFMA. But I remember that instance. That was quite an exciting time. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. Swarms of United States aircraft fly in formation overhead as the ceremony ends. But anyway, we did that. As I said, I was towards the, about the last six months of the war, which wasn't as intense as it was before. But, but anyway, they came on a, a, with a loudspeaker and said, the war, Japanese have surrendered and, and we can surrender and come in. And they said it in English one time, said it in Japanese, in, in English and in Japanese, in English and Japanese. We had found out, oh, maybe uh, two or three weeks before that we were fixed to be invade Japan. Yeah. And, uh, but we didn't know they were going to drop the atomic bomb. You know, nobody knew that. Mm -hmm. Truman saved my life. I feel like he saved my life by dropping the atomic bomb because it would have been they said a million Americans have lost their lives, the Japanese probably two or three million, but anyway. But the very next day after MacArthur signed the peace treaty on the battleship Missouri, I was on Japan liberating prisoners, and we were getting those fellas out. And I can remember one fella coming out, he didn't have just had a pair of old, old khaki old pants and then no shirt on, and they were so hungry. And they had raw flour they're trying to cook, make some biscuits and so forth. And they were just, those GIs were just starved to death. They were gobbling that raw flour, just eating and it fell down on them. And you could see every rib they had, just that flour would fall on the rib and fall down the rib. So anyway, we got there and then I spent a year year on the occupation of Japan. And, uh, but those Japanese did not give us a bit of trouble when the war was over and they surrendered they did not give us a bit of trouble whatsoever. But we'd meet Japanese that had surrendered and they came on a bicycle riding to meet us. They'd get off the bicycle and bow down to the ground until we got by and after we got by, they'd get up on the bicycle and ride, keep riding and never look back at us, never looked at us. But I was there for about a year and they deactivated my outfit and made a military policeman out of it for the occupation of Japan. In fact, I might tell you something, but when I got home... <clears throat> yeah, that was going to be my next question. What was, what was life like after you got back? Well, after I got home, well, I came back and went to work with my parents having them on in the dairy business. And in fact, I ended up taking over that and running it. And then I joined another company, took my business and joined them. And I became, I was a assistant manager and sales manager of this company, but, uh, and I was 27, 28 years old then. I can't say it affected me. It made me grow up, made me become a, a, a man, you know. I was uh, about 22, I think, 21 when I went in. But you know, that was, what, 70 years ago? So that's uh, 70 years ago, two years ago. So, but anyway, I, I do remember a lot about it, but I'm blessed that, you know, at, at 93 years of age, I've I still got pretty good memory, so, so uh, it's a lot of stuff I do. Stuff happened yesterday, I can't remember that. <laughs> but I've had a good life. You see, I, I've, I came out okay. I've given you all a pretty good lesson. <laughs> yeah, you've given us a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Definitely. Son, and that's his, his two sons, and that's a nephew that lives next door. And that's his son and his wife, and one, two, three, four kids and her husband. I have my daughter, she lives in Los Angeles, that's my son. No, oh, that's my son right, yeah, right there. And that's his wife and his one, two, three kids. Wow, beautiful family. That's a pretty good family, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> yeah.